in here. Oh. Okay, so compression compression member uh, design. Okay, so under compression member design, we discussed a different kind of buckling modes, but in uh, this morning session, what we're going to do is concentrate on two buckling modes. One is local buckling, and the other is uh, global buckling. Um, we're going to calculate the different design buckling nodes uh, in there, so I'm going to do an example on that, uh, and you're going to do one. The calculation of the different uh, buckling uh, resistant values will be discussed. I'm going to give a, a, an example. There's four primary uh, forms of buckling. You have local buckling, uh, flexural buckling, torsional buckling, torsional flexural buckling. So today we're going to look at local buckling. We're going to uh, look at flexural um, or lateral uh, buckling. So local buckling uh, occurs in a localized area where uh, when compared to the overall length of the structural element. So this is uh, okay. So this is a beam here that's in bending. So the overall length of the beam. So let's say it spans from over here on the left hand side right the way to somewhere over here on the right hand side. There's a load applied to the top flange here to the concrete um, slab. And on top of the concrete slab, there's a load being applied. As that load is being applied, it um, pushes the member down the way. Uh, so then we get this beam. It's a beam. It's in flexure. It's in bending. We can see it's uh, it's bending shape here. The bottom flange is going to be in tension, so it's been stretched, and then the top flange up here is in compression. Okay, so that top flange is in compression. As we squash that top flange in compression, we can then see that there's actually some local buckling. So uh, it kicks out here locally, and out here locally, and so on all the way along. Okay, so it's local because we can see the length of this buckle. So it buckles from here uh, to here, and the length of this buckle over here from here to here are short relative to the overall length of the member. If the buckling is uh, similar length to the overall member, so if I got a ruler, um, but, uh, oh, but if that ruler was in bending and I bent it down, you can see that the buckling or the bending in this is the same as the overall uh, length of the member. So that's a global effect okay so we can say have the same with the buckling we can have um, a local effect the length of the buckle is short relative to the overall length of the member or we can have a global buckle uh, where the uh, length of the buckling is similar to the length of the member okay, so it's dictated by the slenderness the width the thickness ratio and in this uh, example here the, uh, the length the width uh, is from the web out to the edge of the flange, and the thickness is the thickness of the flange here. So it's that ratio of this length here, it's uh, the free kind of cantilever uh, length and the thickness. That's the ratio. So the bigger that is, the more susceptible it is to local buckling. Local buckling case uh, is determined by the cross sectional behavior, and uh, we check that first. So it's the first check that we're going to check before the other three uh, buckling cases, and the other three buckling cases being flexural, a torsional, or torsional flexural buckling. Um, then we may limit the capacity of the member that's very slender if we do have local buckling. So we have uh, that um, member in, in bending. So if we had the member in bending, there's a beam right here, uh, and we have a bending moment on that beam. There's a couple on each end a moment. So if you imagine that beam, a ruler that you have in your hand, and you put a couple on both ends uh, and bend it down. So that's the moment. That will apply a moment on the beam. So if we look at the uh, bend the moment diagram, it's uh, zero, and then it jumps up to a moment. That moment is constant all the way across. Moment to the other side down to zero. Okay. And if we have that 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 beam say in uh, this area here, we're in the elastic range. So that elastic range. I'm sorry. I'm coming in. Yeah, there's going to be an assignment at the end. That's the plan. There's going to be an assignment at the end of the at the end of the class. Okay, so um, okay, so this initial part of the curve. So we have a uh, moment, applied moment. That applied moment is the applied moment here, uh, and on the bottom here we have uh, rotation. Okay, so we have rotation on the bottom here. So the rotation, as I take the beam. 
because I apply the moment to it, it's going to bend down like this, and the rotation is how much it has uh, rotated on, on the free ends there, and how much it's deflected by uh, in the middle here. Okay, so when I plot rotation, uh, which is down here, against the moment that's being applied, uh, the initially uh, it's elastic. So in other words, it's a linear relationship between uh, between moment and rotation. Okay, so moment, as I, if I double the moment, I double the rotation. So if I double the, the applied moment on the end, so in other words, if I get my uh, two hands on the end of the ruler, I put twice as much of a, of a force to uh, rotate it around, then it will rotate at the ends by twice the amount. So that's in the, in the elastic range. And that elastic range uh, goes all the way up to here. Okay, it's linear between moment and, uh, and rotation. Then after that, what can happen is then that we get into permanent deformation. So in other words, if I was able to get the ruler and keep uh, ending on the end, uh, rotating it at the end, if I could put enough force onto it up to uh, here, what happens is it continues to rotate at the end. It's not taking, uh, taking kind of, it's not a linear relationship between the moment I have to apply and the rotation uh, in it, and it starts to come up. So what happens is that I'm starting to yield the material as I go along here. If I uh, Unload, uh, say along here. So I've rotated as far as here, and I unload it. And then what will happen is um, it will go back down, and then I get this end up getting this permanent uh, rotation. Okay, so that's that's a permanent rotation here. So in other words, my ruler is going to have a permanent ro rotation of this amount. Uh, and I'm never going to have, I'm not going to have a straight ruler again unless I rotate, unless I put a moment on the counterclockwise direction to try and straighten it back up again. Okay, so once we exceed uh, the yield point, after that, then what's going to end up happening uh, is that we're going to put a permanent deformation uh, into the member. Okay. So if we have uh, this member uh, that we're loading up, uh, if it's a class one section, we're going to follow this uh, top curve here. In other words, that curve is that it's uh, elastic all the way until it yields. So some of the fibers in the material are going to yield. Uh, and then we keep our, um, loading it further and further and further, uh, all the way up until we get failure at the end. So we can get full, full plasticity uh, in there. So we call that a class one section. Class two section means that we can still achieve uh, the yield point. So past the elastic up to the plastic level, which is this one here. We can achieve that, but then we don't get much more rotation after that before we end up getting uh, softening. So in other words, as I keep uh, uh, twisting the end or uh, bending the ends with my moment, the moment couple at the end of the ruler, as I keep um, putting the moment on there, I get to a point that actually I don't need to apply any extra moment. So up here, I don't need to apply any extra moment, uh, and I'm going to get an increase in rotation. So it actually takes less effort uh, to rotate the beam from here onwards, uh, and then it eventually it's going to fail. Okay, so that's class two because it's got limited rotational capacity. We can get a little bit of rotational capacity out of it, uh, and then actually it takes less effort to make it rotate after that. Class three section, uh, where we end up getting local buckling uh, in there. So some uh, somewhere along the member, some part of it, there's a little local buckle across the member, uh, and that um, prevents attainment of full plastic moment. So we get that where it happens where we meet the elastic, uh, but we don't get up to the uh, the full plasticity in there. So that's we call that a class three section. And a class four section is a section that we, we don't even get to the yield point of the material. Uh, so we just get to a point uh, in the material uh, where we don't get yield, but we get a local buckle and it prevents it from attaining the full yield, full yield moment in there. So what does that look like? Well, if I take a cross section through here and I look at the um, stress diagram oops sorry hold on did a good job there okay so if i take a, a stress diagram to the section at this point here so i've got a stress on the bottom stress on the top say the one on the bottom uh, is going to be in tension T on the top is in, in uh, compression. That's the stress uh, throughout the section. OK, 
Okay, so that section, this is the neutral axis of the section. So neutral axis is a section where there's no stress whatsoever. So you can see the stress in the middle there at zero. Stress is maximum on the bottom and maximum on the, on the top. So that's a, bring that over here. So that's my section. My section has got height there. That's got the thickness here. Oh. Got a thickness there. Okay, so it's got a height and a, and a and a thickness associated with it. And the neutral axis is along the middle here. Okay, so I've got uh, stress drain on it. Uh, and that means I can load it up the top stress. And that stress at the top is less than the yield stress in the material. The stress at the bottom is less than the yield stress in the material. So in other words, I can load it up. I get this. Uh, so the top fiber has got this stress. Next fiber has got a little bit less. Next fiber down a little bit less. And the middle fiber across the neutral axis has got uh, has got no stress uh, in it. Okay, so top stress, at, uh, maximum stress at the top. Stress gets a little bit uh, less as we take down different slices. Different slices gets less, and then in the middle you've got no stress whatsoever. And the same another way. Then you have got uh, all of these are in tension. So it's like if I imagine this is taking slices of pages uh, in through it. The bottom one that we put in the most uh, pulling or most uh, tension force in the very bottom page here. Not enough to yield it. Um, and then the next one is a bit less, and all the way uh, through. Whoa! Is that right? What's happening here? Okay, um, so if I go to a different uh, point along this uh, graph, so if I take the uh, yield point over here, and the stress strain curve for that yield point uh, is going to end up being like this. So I get the top stress and compression is equal to the yield strength, and the one in tension is equal to the yield strength. Okay, so that means that I'm, I've yielded the, that very last fiber, the outside fiber down here, top fiber and bottom fiber, they're just yielded. Okay, so I've just made the yield uh, of it. So that very, very outside fibers, uh, the stress that's in those is the, is the stress that will cause the fiber to yield. In other words, if I stretch that, try and put more um, stress on it past this, then it's going to end up getting permanent deformation in it. You're not going to be able to fully recover back to its original place, back down to here in there that's at the that's at the yield point and then as i start to go out uh, through it so we'll take a point here uh, later on so now i've got the top fibers in yielded bottom fiber is in ooh. the top fiber here is equal to the yield uh, the bottom fiber is equal to the yield. But what's happening is, and the neutral axis is in the middle here. What's happening now is that other fibers are also at the yield because the top one says I'm at yield, I can't take any more, so that outside fiber can't take any more. And the next fiber down has to start to do more effort. Okay, and the next one has to do more effort, uh, and so on. So they all those uh, fibers end up getting uh, having to do the full effort. They end up getting something like and maybe the last few fibers in the middle uh, are not yielded. Okay, so in this case, the outside fiber is still at yield, same as this case here. But because we want to put more um, stress on it, more bending moment on it, we said, okay, that outside fiber can't take any more stress, but this outside fiber can't take any more stress. But what about these other guys? They're not doing uh, as much work um, because they're not fully, they've got still more capacity. This fiber along here has more capacity. Before it gets out to the yield and the next fibers and more capacity and so on uh, so imagine if you're doing your group project so we're going to do a group project here in um, steel design later on uh, and there's uh, three people in the group so the first person is doing uh, uh, fully maxed out really really stressed out fully maxed out can't do any more work the next person is only doing say half the amount of work and the last person in the middle is doing no work whatsoever so 
that's not maximizing all the uh, all the capacity of everyone in the team because if one person is maxed out in terms of stress, the next person isn't doing is, is only doing half the amount, and the last person isn't doing anything. To get the full um, team fully maxed out, top uh, the, the top person here or one person here is fully maxed out. Now we're maxing out the next person, and maybe the last person is about halfway maxed out. By the time we get to the very end. And we have a full uh, full plasticity developed, so that is well, that is actually full plasticity. But here, let's see, we we'll just draw it here. Full plasticity, where every single fiber uh, in the uh, cross section is at its uh, is at its uh, yield. Okay, so every single fiber in compression is at its yield. Every fiber in tension is at its yield. But we do have a little bit extra capacity in 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 these things where. We end up we could actually get the top fibers going a bit, a bit more work uh, and the bottom fibers doing, doing a, a little bit more work. And the reason why they can do a little bit more work, so in this example here, we have the stress that's in that type fiber, it's greater than FY. And the reason for that, why can we go uh, greater than yield? But well, there's something called strain hardening. So the material can take it a little bit more stress than uh, uh, than the yield point before it uh, before it actually ends up breaking, and that's called strain hardening. So that's why we might have a little bit higher uh, capacity uh, than the yield capacity. Okay, so that's how it would work if we have no local buckling uh, in the different sections. But as I said, sometimes we might be limited on the um, force or the moment that we apply to a beam or the or the load, the axial load that we apply to a member. In compression uh, due to local buckling. If we don't have any problems with local buckling, we can get high rotation capacity so we can get that beam uh, over here. Get a lot of rotation of that beam. Okay, so that's the rotation at the end of the beam. So we can get a lot of rotation at the end of the beam um, if we can get to class one section without it failing. Class two means we can just get up to yield just past uh, the plastic limit and we have limited rotation capacity. Class three means that we get local buckling happens just after we get uh, after we get uh, to the yield point. So just after we get to um, the yield point here. Um, then we get some uh, plastic or local buckling and we can't get full plastic moment back out of it. Okay, so we get guidance in the European design codes to allow us to do this. So the Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1, uh, clause 5.5 .5 and table 5.2 is going to provide us with the checks on that. I'm going to show you that in a second. It's probably on this one. Okay, so this is the table that helps us to um, to work out uh, how susceptible our member might be to local buckling. So we look at all the individual little component parts of it. So we're going to, in our first example, we're going to concentrate on the, on the roll section. Um, and uh, so we want to look at an I section. We can see that this length here is C. That's the unstiffened length of the web. So this is the web here. Okay, so that's the web. And that's the unstiffened length of the web. Because uh, you can see, if you look carefully, you can see that it kind of thickens out here at the bottom due to the root radius, thickens out the top due to the root radius. So the unstiffened length um, is that. But the ratio then in terms of the slenderness of that web is C divided by the thickness T. Okay. So same thing if we have uh, a welded section, it's from the bottom of the weld. So you can see the weld there. So it's from the bottom of the weld. Pull that down. Okay. Uh, we're going to an example that you're going to do yourselves. It's a box section. So we're going to look from here to here. Value of C, or is the value of C. So you can see that there's a, at the corners, when, when you make the box section, you can see at the corners, it's kind of thickens up at the corners. So we start from where uh, it's not thickened up all the way down. So that's C value. So again, it's C over T is the, how slender the, the element is. Okay, and so what we want to do is we're going to, we're uh, today, so I described it in terms of uh, bending. So we use this column for bending, uh, where we have all these uh, limits, C over T ratios for bending. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a member that's under compression load. So we're going to concentrate on this column here. So we have a member that's uh, 
actually loaded in compression. So you put a, a, a force on either end. So you take your ruler and squash the ruler on each end. That's the force that, uh, that we're going to put on, on it. And if we take a cross section through, through that, through the middle, x, x, then this is what the cross section would look like. So say a section, x, x. Okay, so it could look like the, uh, that section there. As we squash it uh, down, we want to check uh, to see if uh, this um, web, how slender that web is, and if it might local buckle. So let's see if I can, I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw a 3D uh, section of this, but let's, let's try and do it. There's a member. Come down. on the screen, but we'll try. Okay, so that's the that's that member uh, box section. I'm talking about box section, uh, an I section or universal um, a beam or universal column. So we're going to put a load onto it, load on the top, load on the bottom of it. And then if there's uh, local buckling, what if local buckling happens? Well, what could happen is, say, this bit of the flange here, we're looking at this little place, the flange here, um, through here. That, that little bit of the flange could end up going uh, out. That. So we end up getting that local the flange here heading off out that way. We get a local buckle like that, and the other um, the other flange could end up doing the same. Okay, so that it could end up happening. Um, so you can see the flange here heads off out sideways. Okay, we've got a local buckle coming out like that uh, on the flange. So we're going to check on the next page from the flange. So if that was this, in this case, that would be this flange. Uh, so there could be a flange there could head off out lo locally from, uh, from, from the member. We could also get the, um, it could also be the, the web uh, in there. So the web in this middle part in here. So that web, we draw the, the, the plan. Uh, version so let's see uh, that's one one example so another example that's uh, so that could be land a local buckling if I'd be able to do the web local buckling in 3d let's do it in 2d just see if I can okay that's a that's a plan view and view. Okay, so um, okay, so there's a plan view of the web buckling. So the web can head off outside of us like that. Head off side of us like that, okay. So we've got this local buckle here that heads off, off sideways. Again, we said it's local if it's short in length compared to the overall uh, length. So so if the overall length um, the section Okay, that's the same section again, um, the 3D version of the section. And then that it starts to head off out this way. Okay, so we can see that web now has, starts to head off out, uh, buckles off out this way. Okay, so that's a, it's a 3D version of that, of that. So hopefully my uh, 
and the sketches will show uh, that that's a web buckling uh, in here. So it's a local buckle because it's short in length relative to the overall length. And here's some flange buckling. So what we need to do is we need to check uh, the slenderness of this web and the slenderness of that uh, flange as well. So the slenderness of the web, the height of the web divided by the thickness of the web. You have an element that's under compression. If it's class one section, then the height of the unstiffened web divided by the thickness of the unstiffened web has to be less than or equal to 33 epsilon. Okay, so the, this uh, distance here, C divided by T, has to be less than or equal to 33 times epsilon. Okay, we know that epsilon down the bottom here is equal to the square root of 235 divided by Fy. Fy uh, is being the uh, material uh, strength. Okay, so Fy down here. So we know that Fy is equal to the nominal um, yield strength of the material. And actually, we get, we'll get that from table um, 3.1 in the code. In a minute, I'll show you how to get that. Okay. But we can see uh, if we take a, if we assume in this example that Fy is equal to 275 newtons per millimeter squared, when I put that into the formula on here, 235 divided by 275, proves that, then epsilon is going to work out to be 0.92. So it's actually done the calculator from me. So that's the calculation, 0.92. And that means that the C over T ratio, the height of the web divided by the thickness of the web, sorry, the height of the unstiffened web divided by the thickness of the web, uh, has to be less than or equal to 33 epsilon. So less than 33 times 0.92, which is around, say, 30 or something like that. Okay, so if my uh, unstiffened length divided by the thickness is less than about 30, then it's a class one section. What does that mean? Class one section means I can achieve full plasticity of the section uh, without uh, having any local buckling. Okay. So it means it's unlikely I'm going to see any of this uh, local buckling here. I might get a class two section. So if it doesn't, if, if the ratio of C over T is not less than 33 epsilon, and then I go on and check, well, is it a class two section? So is C over T less than or equal to 38 epsilon? Uh, if it is, so if it's between 33 and 38 epsilon, uh, then it's going to be a class two section. Okay. So what does a class two section mean? What a class two section means uh, here is that we can get full plasticity out of it, uh, but it's limited ro rotation. And in practice, what that means is we can use the same design equations for class one and class two a section in our design. If, uh, if our value isn't, um, so if our C over T ratio isn't less than 38 uh, epsilon for the uh, flange, uh, then what we end up having to do is we, we go and check, well, is it a class three section? Is it less than 42 epsilon? So in other words, is the C over T ratio uh, for the, sorry, for the web, I'm looking at the web at the moment, is the C over T ratio for the web less than or equal to 42 uh, epsilon? So somewhere between 38 and 42, it's a class three section. For the class three section, that means that, yes, we can get uh, um, material to yield, uh, but then we're going to get local buckling that stops full plasticity from, from happening. If, uh, if the C over T ratio is greater than 42 epsilon, then it's a class four uh, section. Okay, so it's a class four section. If C over T ratio um, is, so, it's, uh, so we have a class four section. If C over T uh, ratio is greater than 42 epsilon. So in other words, what happened, what that means, uh, the practice is that we can't get the yield, we can't get the yield of the material, we're going to get local buckling before we get that yield of the, of the material. Okay, so that's for the that's for the uh, web and for the flange is something very very similar. So for the flange, there's the unstiffened length uh, of the flange. If we have a um, an eye section, and then we have uh, it's subject to compression, and if we want a class one section. Then it's on stiffened length divided by the thickness of the flange has to be less than 9 epsilon for a class 1. Class 2, it's less than 10, more than 9. Class 2 section and class 3 section, less than 14, more than 10. Class 4 section is uh, greater, than, greater than 14. Okay, so if we want class 4 section, if we have a class 4 section, then C over T ratio is greater than 14 epsilon. Okay, 
So that's the first thing we're going to do with any section um, in there. So whether we're going to design a, an element that's in compression load, which is what we're going to do today, or if we're designing an element that's in bending, uh, we're going to end up classifying the section first to see how susceptible it is to local buckling, because that's going to limit um, that's going to limit its capacity to carry carry loads. Okay, so that's uh, that's the first thing. Uh, what uh, so and what has uh, what is it that's that's um, the factors that are actually limiting the carry load that that we can see that might um, affect local buckling? So what do we talk about? Uh, so factors uh, that affect local buckling. So we just looked at the C over T ratio, uh, just there. So that's effectively the the width. So with the thickness uh, ratio of the plate components. Okay, so that the little any part of the of the uh, member, so whether the web or the flange uh, in there. So that's the. That section here, so we have that uh, C divided by thickness, that's for the web. And we also had that for the flange as well. This one's different length here, C divided by uh, thickness, and that's for the flange. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one factor we just uh, talked about. Um, the other uh, factor that could um, affect uh, local buckling um, is going to be the uh, well, the element um, support conditions. Okay, so the element support conditions are going to end up affecting uh, the the um, local buckling. So if we have a member that's uh, pen penned and we load it up like that um, on the end, or if we have a member uh, that has a fixity, and another fixity on the other end, so we'll put it on, on locks. We load it up like that. Um, then when we, when we load the, these members up, the first one would have a global buckling like that. The next one could have global buckling like uh, this. And then, because of the of the uh, stress distribution that's put into it, you could end up getting some local buckling at, at different uh, points within the within the element. So the support conditions, and more so, I suppose, for elements uh, in uh, uh, in bending. So in in uh, that's an axial law, but more so for ones in bending, because why the support condition like this uh, for a beam that's sitting over a number of different uh, and a load on top of it, a number of different supports. And then I'm going to end up getting a bending, um, bending moment diagram. It looks something like uh, this, which means that at the different locations, so in this case, um, the compression uh, flange is going to be on the top here. Okay, So that's the bit that might be susceptible to local buckling, whereas over the support, it could be the compression flange is uh, on the bottom, and out here the compression flange is on the top. So it depends on support conditions that can affect uh, what the bending moment looks like. Therefore, it affects which part is in compression. So in this case, the compression is on the top here, on the bottom here, uh, and it's on the on the top here. And it's only those parts of the beam or parts of the element, um, the steel element, that are under compression uh, that are susceptible to local buckling. So in this case, it's over the support uh, at the mid-span and so on, or, the, or, or will have the highest uh, moments in them and therefore the highest compression stresses in the, the compression flanges. Um, the material strength. So the material strength. So the material strength. Stop it. Oh uh, no. Come on. So the material strength, FY. Um, is going to affect it. So we, we know that the C over T ratio is less than or equal to a number, something times epsilon, uh, where uh, epsilon is equal to the square root of 235 
uh, divided by F1. Okay, so that means that the, the stronger the material is, uh, the, the, the least susceptible it is, or the, the less susceptible it is to local, local buckling, because the, so, so the stronger the material, sorry, the bigger that number, so the bigger that number is, that means the smaller that number is, uh, and the smaller that number is, and the C over T ratio is smaller. Sorry, so the, the uh, stronger the material is, the more susceptible it is to local buckling. Okay. Um, the next one then that could cause uh, that um, that might, the next factor that might affect local buckling uh, is how we fabricate. It's the fabrication uh, process. So we kind of classify sections. Do we fabricate it using hot rolled, so that the steel is hot and when it's rolled? Is it cold formed? So it's a steel, uh, and it's a flat place, place of uh, material uh, that's cold, and then we just bend it in a, in a press to make the shape, or maybe it might be welded. Okay, so that's going to affect it. So why, why does that, why, why that affect it? Well, that might affect it because there's something called uh, residual stresses that are built into it. Depends on how you how you fa fabricate the, the element. So it depends on how you fabricate the element. You may end up having uh, some residual stresses that are are, are are locked into the member. So those residual stresses then might cause um, some local local buckling. So let me see. We can draw. They're not cause local buckling, but uh, reduce the capacity of the section uh, and its ability to carry load before local buckling occurs. Okay, so here's a here's an eye section uh, in there. Okay, so if I have it, okay, out here. Okay, so let's see if I can draw residual stress on this um, member. So we may end up having a residual stress where there's a little stress on the top. Um, flange coming out like this uh, and the other side in it but then it will go across like this there's a little residual stress that's uh, built into the into the flange now we might have uh, something similar on the bottom one so as we roll this section so this is a hot roll section um, and as we roll to manufacture the section uh, we might get uh, residual stress on the top and the bottom and then in the web as well oh, we might have a residual stress in the web that might Look something like this as well. Okay, so there's a stress already. So we, before we even apply any axial load to the member, so before we get a member, before we even apply any any load to this member, this is the overall member. So before we even apply any load to the member, uh, we may end up having some stress uh, across the in the, built into the member already. So without even applying any external load to the member, so this is the member here. Before we apply any external load to the member. There's already stresses built in, and those stresses are built in due to the fabrication uh, process. Okay, uh, so that's one, two, three, four. That's uh, four, four examples of uh, four reasons why we might get uh, might affect the local buckling. And I suppose uh, the the last one then that I have here is uh, the applied uh, stress. A system. Okay, so for example, you know, are we, is it a member that's in uh, compression? We're going to put a, a uh, compression force on it, like in the, in the on the top right there. So compression, where we have uh, N and N onto a member, or is it in bending? Okay, like a beam in bending. Uh, and we end up putting a, a moment on it. Okay, so we can see how that affects the um, the, the values. So we see here that there's a, if I go for the um, the web, we can see that the web under um, if we have a web under compression load, it looks the stress distribution looks like that. Whereas if we have a web under bending, it looks like 
look like looks like that. So you can see that you know, under compression that all of the web uh, here, all of the web uh, is almost under compressive stress, which is a plus uh, number here. Whereas in bending, it has a neutral axis across to the middle here. Everything over the neutral axis is in compression. Everything under the neutral axis is in tension uh, in there. So not so that means that when this element tries to uh, uh, local buckle sideways, when it's in uh, so in 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 uh, this instance here, we've got a the element here like this. Um, the bottom side here is in tension. So all that part of it is in tension. So that won't move anywhere because if you if you put something in tension, you're stretching it so it can't move sideways. Whereas the um, top part here is all in, in compression. So therefore, if that tries to uh, buckle out sideways, if we load that axially, uh, if we load that in bending, uh, then what might happen is this part of it from the neutral axis up might head off sideways the rest of it will stay where it is and we could end up getting it some sort of local buckle like like that whereas in the in the next instance in here uh, the element if we have uh, green is in is in uh, tension red is in compression so this member is fully is an axially loaded member uh, fully in compression which is what I've drawn over here on the right hand side. Okay. That's that one. Uh, it's all under compression. So therefore, uh, what can end up happening is that all of that web ends up buckling out uh, sideways. Okay. All that web ends up buckling out sideways. Uh, so this one on the right, this one is uh, more chance of having local buckling because we have the full um, length of the web. So we have the full end of the web here to buckle, whereas in the other one here, we have only a, a, a half of the web, for example, to buckle. That's why um, that's why the applied stress system, whether it's fully under compression, fully axial load under compression, or under bending, is going to affect the uh, whether it's going to have low or the, the uh, its susceptibility to local buckling. Okay, so what does that mean in, um, in our design process? That means in our design process, uh, how do we determine uh, whether something's going to local buckle? So we're going to do a classification the section, classification of the section. So we're going to classify whether it's a class one, class two, class three, um, class four section. And what's affecting classification of the section is what's the, is the factors affecting local buckling, which are these factors, four, five factors that we've said here. Uh, with the thickness ratio of the plate component, uh, the element support conditions, the uh, material strength, and the fabrication process, the applied stress system. Okay, so that's the so that's the first check we're going to do in our in our example. Get on to our example. The second check we're going to do is uh, is the flexural lateral buckling. Okay, so as we said, the local buckling is a, is a, is a short um, length. It's got some uh, local deformation in it, um, local buckling out of it. That's why it's called local buckling. Whereas flexural or lateral buckling is the whole uh, of the length or part or, or a good length um, is uh, is buckling outside of it. So in this case here, we have an unloaded member. We put an axial load into the member by loading it from both ends, like taking a ruler and loading it from both ends, squashing it down. And then like a ruler will kick out sideways as we put a load into it. And what determines how much it's going to kick out or when it, what the load is or what the force that we can apply until it, uh, until it buckles, um, that can be determined uh, using the provisions in Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1, which is 6.3. If we have a slender member um, and this buckling happens in the elastic range, in other words, if I get my ruler and I squash my ruler, this is a timber ruler, so it uh, doesn't have much capacity for uh, local buckling but, or for global buckling, but when I squash that out, it's going to kick out sideways. I unload it, it comes back to its perfectly uh, straight condition again. So the condition it was before I loaded it in. That means that that's elastic behavior because it's fully recovering after I unload it. Okay. Whereas if it, if, if it doesn't fully recover, then that means I've gone into inelastic. In other words, I've put more load on it. It has caused some of the material to go past its yield point. 
um, and it's then uh, has per some permanent uh, deformation in there. Okay, so Euler's buckling form is what can be used for the elastic um, load uh, in there. But Euler's buckling pertains to an ideal column, so it's saying it's perfectly straight, it's homogeneous, there's no residual uh, stresses in it, and so on. And we can use this kind of uh, idea of the sphere and the surface analogy to describe the buckling state. So if the load is less than the critical uh, uh, buckling capacity, uh, then it's a stable condition. So it's like uh, the, the ball will wait there, it can roll back and over, but it'll always recover back into the center. Whereas if you put the load uh, greater than the um, elastic capacity, it's unstable, but the ball is going to roll off uh, over to the side. Okay, so how do we calculate the um, flexural buckling? Uh, in there, so the Euler formula, as we know from our strengths and materials, is, um, is equal to pi squared EI or L squared. We have a subscript Y here because that describes the buckling about the major axis. The major axis being the stiffer axis here. So in this cross section area here, we have the YY is the stiffer axis. That's uh, buckling about uh, that axis. And the ZZ is the weaker axis, so it's booked in about, about that axis, the ZZ. So we have to check uh, what the um, capacity is about the YY axis and about the ZZ axis. So that's why we have the subscript Zs here uh, and the subscripts uh, Y here. So in terms of what, what's Y, Y is the second uh, moment of, of area. Okay, so Y here is the, the second moment. Of area, and this is about uh, the yy axis because it's in it's the yy. Okay, so this is down here uh, in there. So um, is equal to the integral of uh, z squared dA, uh, which comes out to be the cross section area times the uh, yy, uh, which is the radius of gyration. Okay, so that radius, that uh, radius of gyration is equal to the square root of the second moment of area, and A is just a cross-sectional area. So I'll write that in. Uh, a is the uh, cross-sectional area. Okay. So, uh, so if the radius of gyration is the square root of the second moment of area, divided by the cross-section area. So for a given section, we can look up at the table properties of it to get those, uh, what I, Y is, to get what A is, and actually to get what the radius of gyration is. So we take the member here. So this member, uh, this member here, has got a length from here to here. So that's the overall length of the member. Um, and then because it's a simple, this is a, um, it's got simple supports. So it's got simple support. So in other words, uh, what it allows us to do, you can get full rotation on both ends. So full rotation on both ends, simple support. And the elastic um, uh, critical uh, buckling capacity, in other words, from Euler's formula, is pi squared, so pi being 3.14, and multiplied by E. So E is um, your, uh, E uh, is your Young's modulus. And that's, in other words, that's the material uh, stiffness. Okay, so Young's modulus is your material stiffness uh, value. So you have a material stiffness value, and then I is your um, cross-section stiffness value. So it depends on what the cross-section properties are in terms of the shape. That tells you what your cross-section stiffness is. E is the material it's made from. So for steel, that's 210 newtons per, sorry, 210 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. That's the material stiffness. Pi squared, so pi is a constant, 3.14. And L squared, so L is the is the length of the member. So that's L squared. And then when it's a simply supported member, um, the critical length uh, is equal to 1.0 times L. So we have the uh, pi squared EI over uh, the critical length uh, squared. So if I double the length, so if I have a, a long ruler compared to a short ruler, so if I double the length of my ruler, so I have a long ruler that's uh, twice the length of my shorter ruler. So if I double the length here, uh, then that will uh, increase the this factor underneath by four. Uh, so it means that the 
uh, buckling capacity um, is down by uh, is reduces by four. So the buckling capacity of a of a of a longer ruler is four is is uh, one quarter of that of a ruler that's half as length. Okay, so if you try that in there, so if I try putting in, um, so if I change that in there for uh, L over two, for example, uh, then I get out um, and that will give me in a uh, is equal to uh, pi squared e i. Um, So that's half, yeah, half the length of ruler. So it'll give me four pi squared ei over l squared. Okay, so by reducing the length by a half, if I reduce the length by a half, I increase the buckling capacity by four times. Okay. So, so that has a big impact. So we need to consider that when we're designing our members. The length of the member here. Um, as a big influence because it's a, because there's a square here. Okay, so the square here. So if I double, uh, sorry, if I have the effective length uh, in there, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the buckling capacity by four. If I have a member that has got a, a pin, so it can freely rotate on one side, but it's uh, fixed on the other side. In other words, I'm maintaining this 90 degree angle in there. Then the critical length, uh, this length here, is equal to 0.7 times the overall length. Whereas if I have something that's fixed on both ends. Uh, it maintains a 90 degree angle, then the critical length here is equal to 0 0.5 times the overall length. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if I have a member, to try and increase its um, capacity to carry load and compression, I can make it a shorter member. So for half the length of the member, I can make the, um, the capacity four times. I could change the in conditions. So the in condition here is pinned, pinned on the other side. So if I change that to a fixed, fixed in condition, and the critical, uh, elastic critical um, length is half times the overall length. So in other words, a fixed, fixed member compared to a pin, pin member, has got four times the buckling capacity uh, of a pin, 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 pin member. So a fixed, fixed member has got four times the buckling capacity as a pin, pin member. Plus, as a designer, I can choose that to make it a stronger element uh, to carry more load for the compression. I can make it a fixed, fixed support. And that way, if it's elastic and booked in, that will increase its capacity by four times. Or I could say, well, I can have a shorter member, uh, or I can restrain the member along halfway along its length, so that it can't kick out sideways halfway along its length, and then I would increase its capacity by four times. So without changing the cross-sectional shape, uh, just by putting in a restraint at halfway along, I can increase the capacity by four times. Or by changing the in conditions to fix fixed from pin pin, I can increase the capacity by four times. That's why, it's, you know, if we can understand these equations as a designer, it can help us in making the right decisions uh, are the most efficient uh, design solution uh, uh, in there. Okay. So very short columns will fail by yielding. So we have a, a diagram here, which is the um, load against the normalized synchronous. So effectively for now, if we think the normalized synchronous, the bigger the value here on the x-axis, the more slender the member is. Uh, the, the, the smaller the, the number is, the less slender it is. In other words, the more stocky the member is. And here's the uh, the axial uh, load that we're applying to the, to the member. Okay, so it's the same thing. We have a member, and we're applying a, an axial load uh, to that to that member. Okay, so if we have a if we have a long member, then that long member here, our slender member, that is. Uh, the critical buckling. So that's, in other words, that is being determined by the Euler buckling formula. Uh, so that's equal to pi squared e i all over l squared. Okay, so that's for the slender member. However, if we have a, a member that's a very stocky, a short member, then it's not going to buckle uh, elastically. What's going to happen is that we're going to have a yielding of the material. Okay, so the yielding of the material in PY is equal to the cross section resistance or such cross section area times the material strength. Uh, that's in a short member. Okay, so very short columns will fail by um, cross section uh, um, failure. Okay. Now, so that's a short member. It's here a long member. So we now have two equations that we can describe. So a short member just the area how much material is across this cross section times the material strength will give us what the capacity of the member is, it's short. If we have a long slender member, uh, then it's going to be described by Euler buckling formula. 
the the more difficult one is something that's an intermediate uh, length column, so something in between, um, that you're going to end up having some uh, flexural buckling, global buckling. You're going to end up having uh, some other uh, local failures as well. So the intermediate length columns are, are uh, complicated by the residual stresses that we can have, initial deformations uh, that might be in the member when we uh, when we create it. So without even applying any load in the end, it might be slightly buckled out. So if you take your ruler there, have a look at that ruler, uh, you'll probably see that it's not perfectly straight. So there's some sort of uh, initial little bending in it, the thickness of the flange and so on. These are all kind of complicates the behavior in here. So the typical behavior is this dashed line in here. And so we, we the codes had to come up with some uh, way of describing uh, this behavior, in particular for the um, intermediate length ones. And that's described in table 6.1 and 2 in uh, Eurocode 3 part 1 and uh, figure uh, 6.4. We're going to use that in our design example. In there. So the column buckling resistance is described in um, clause 6.3.1 in Eurocode uh, 3, which we'll come to in a second. So this uh, transition uh, buckling curve, so the reasons um, that we uh, will cause the buckling to be maybe lower um, than, than what was uh, than what the theory would say. So these curves are the the um, dash line here is a theory. So on the outside here is your oil of buckling. On the flat part of it is the material uh, yield side of it. Okay, uh, and then the curve uh, under the solid line here is a lower bound curve because all these dots here within it were all tests that were done in the lab uh, in there. So that's tests done in the lab. So I can see that you know tests typically. Uh, will be lower than what the theoretical values are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, and why might they be lower? They might be lower because the law that's applied in reality, there might be some sort of eccentricity applied to it. So how does that look like in my um, in a diagram? So if I, have a, if I have a member like this, and in theory what I'm saying is that the, the load has been applied right through the centroid of the, of the element. But actually, in reality, what might happen is it's slightly off, and even my drawing there, it's slightly off. So if that's the center, centroid, the load for some reason might be you know applied a little bit off due to the connection details or so on. And if it's off by a little amount, so this is how much it's off by. That's the eccentricity of the load that's off, and that's the load. And then we know that a moment is going to be a, a force times distance. So the eccentricity. because the load doesn't pass right through the very center of the element, times the applied load. It's going to give us a moment. Okay. So therefore, some of the, um, therefore some of the um, parts of that member have got not just the axial applied load on it, but also a moment applied on the end of it as well. Okay, so that moment on, on the end of it. So we get some sort of a, a, a moment on the ends here, we have to be able to, um, the, the um, material has to be able to withstand the stresses due to the moment, plus the stresses due to the axial load. Okay, initial crookedness of the columns, so a lack of straightness uh, in there, so we've done lots of tests ourselves on this type of stuff, where, again, if we have the member like this, and before we even put any load on it, just after it's been manufactured, we can see that it might end up having some sort of initial, you know, this is obviously very exaggerated, but there might be an initial um, sideways um, crookedness out of it, and we've measured that, and we've shown that the bigger this number is, so the bigger the initial um, crookedness, uh, then the lower the, the capacity to carry load is. Uh, residual stresses, I described that already uh, earlier on, so that's the stresses that are locked in as a result of the manufacturing process. A strain hardening, um, causes so we have strain hardening. So if I draw a a curve of uh, strain in stress or load against displacement, it's elastic at the beginning, it's going to yield, and then we get some sort of strain hardening. So as we increase uh, the strain, if we increase the strain from here to here, it gets harder, it gets stronger uh, in there until we get to the ultimate, and then we get fracture at the end. But that's going to end up uh, affecting the results. A non-homogeneity of the material, so the material might be the exact same all the way along because there might be some difference in terms of the material properties. Okay, so how does that come through then? So we've described Euler's buckling formula, pi squared EI over the critical um, length uh, squared. 
We can then replace the second moment of area i uh, with a times i squared, i being the radius iteration squared. Uh, and then we bring that i squared down to underneath the line. So then it's LCR divided by uh, i and put the brackets all around it for squared. Uh, and then that means e, uh, pi squared e a uh, all over uh, lambda squared. So lambda in LCR times i. So the critical uh, length um, divided by the critical Buckley length, sorry, divided by the radius of duration is called the column slenderness. And we can actually get those values all the way from um, the, the blue book, which is the book that gives us the sectional properties. And we want to make this non dimensional. So this is a dimension uh, that can be a dimension towards this. We want to make this non dimensionless. Um, and that's defined as equal to the square root of the uh, cross section resistance divided by the critical uh, Buckley resistance. So this one here. Uh, NPL, say RD, is equal to um, the cross sectional resistance, which is effectively at the cross section area at times the material uh, yield strength. And then NCR is equal to your uh, critical elastic. Uh, Buckling capacity. Okay, so in CR, it's pi squared E A all over the lambda squared. Okay, so you then substitute those uh, A F Y in for P L in P L sorry and pi squared E A over uh, lambda squared in for in C R. Square root of all of that, and then you'll end up getting the lambda from the lambda squared in the bottom up over the top, and then you get lambda 1, which is the reference in this value, and that's equal to all this other stuff that's uh, left, which is pi squared e over fy, uh, which equals to pi squared e over 235 um, epsilon squared, uh, and then that equals to, if you put 210,000 uh, in for your Young's modulus, 210,000 newtons per millimeter squared, you will end up getting um, all of this in, in the square root. And that will end up equal to 93.9 epsilon. So in other words, the reference in this value is 93.9 epsilon, where epsilon is equal to the square root of 235 divided by fy. So we could have left uh, this first formula in here for the reference value. I suppose the code tried to tidy it up somewhat and have a 93.9 epsilon, where epsilon is equal to the square root of 235 divided by uh, fy. Okay, and that's set out in this uh, clause here at 6.3.1.3 in the euro code. Um, so the Euler formula covers flexural uh, buckling. Um, Okay, so we have this buckling capacity uh, calculations. The buckling capacity calculation tells us that we're going to use some sort of a buckling reduction factor times a cross sectional resistance. So if I have a member um, that isn't susceptible or to um, flexural buckling, uh, then I'm going to have the capacity reduction factor as one. In other words, I'm going to have no reduction uh, in there for buckling because we're going to be able to withstand all of the um, load from its cross section resistance. And then this is the material factor of safety, which is just uh, one. So it's a partial material factor of safety. And then this uh, Buckling reduction factor in the code is given by this complicated formula one divided by um, this guy here, phi, I think, plus square root of phi squared minus lambda squared or lambda bar squared. And phi is equal to a half into one plus alpha into. Um, lambda bar squared minus 0.2 plus lambda bar squared. So once we know what the normalized slenderness value is, which I showed you how to carry out on the previous page, we can substitute that in there, we can substitute that in there, and the only thing that we're missing is this imperfection factor here, um, alpha. The alpha is the imperfection factor, so that's going to be determined, depends on what the type of material we have, the cross-sectional shape, and so on. And there's a, there's a table 6.1 uh, in the Eurocode 3, helps us to get that. So we have the different uh, um, curves, so we decide uh, which curve it is based on what material um, strength we have, based on which axis that we're looking at the buckling about, and dep depends on the cross-sectional shape. So if we have a um, buckling curve A0 all the way up to D, um, the, as we go from A up to D, uh, then the imperfection factor gets larger. Okay, So the imperfection factor gets larger as we go from A to D, and that means that it'll end up getting that our reduction factor it's smaller, in other words, that our buckling resistance is less. So the more imperfection we have, we go from A to D, the higher that is, uh, then uh, the lower the capacity of the section to carry uh, load uh, before it's going to buckle. 
and then we can use table 6.2 to select the design curves for the various different cross-sections. So what does that look like in the code? So if we go to Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1, uh, clause 6.3.1, we get the buckling resistance. Uh, we um, get the selection of the buckling for the cross-section. So if we have a roll section, for example, like this one, uh, we have to first look at what the height of that section is relative to the width of the section. Uh, and if the height over the width is greater than 1.2, um, and say the flange thickness, so this is the flange at the top, however thick that flange is, if that's less than 40 millimetres, and we're looking at buckling about, say, the YY axis, about the major axis, then we use curve uh, A for these grades of steel, which is typically the grades that we're going to be using. If we're going about the minor axis, so in other words, buckling this way, about this axis, and then we're going to use curve, uh, um, buckling curve B. However, if the thickness of the flange was high, was, was thicker than 40, so somewhere between 40 and 100, uh, then about the YY axis of buckling this way, we'd use curve B. Uh, buckling in the other direction, we'd use curve C. If we have a, a kind of more stocky, remember, in terms of cross-section, so that the height is closer to the width uh, in there, so in other words, the height divided by the width is less than or equal to 1.2, um, then, and the thickness of the flange is less than 100 mil, then we have curve B uh, for YY and curve C for um, ZZ. So just even comparing that, the, you know, the height to width ratio, so if we have something that's tall and slender in terms of cross-section resistance, we're on curve A up here, where if it's something that's um, more stocky, so that its height and its width are, are similar, uh, then we're on curve B. And you see curve A has a, 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 is, has a better capacity than curve B because it's up higher up here. So in other words, that's telling us because there'll be more residual uh, stresses locked in when, it's a, a sh when the ratio of height to, to width is smaller, and then there's chances of having more residual stresses locked in, and the residual stresses are going to reduce its ability to uh, carry load in, in, in compression. Okay, and the same thing as well, if we look at the thickness, um, as we see, if we go from the thickness less than 40 millimeters to the thickness of the flange between 40 and 100, go from curve A to curve B. And then again, that's because the thicker the, um, the section, the more residual stresses that are likely to be locked in. So therefore, the more residual stresses, uh, the, the, um, the bigger the impact or the, the, it reduces its ability to carry uh, load and compression. And then the third thing component that we've been looking at here depends on which axis you're um, looking about, the major axis over the YY or the minor axis over the ZZ. And again, the weaker axis, um, is la there's a chance that there's going to be more initial imperfection uh, as a result of the weak, looking about the weaker axis. Uh, so therefore, you have a lower capacity um, curve for the uh, weaker axis. Okay, so... So we decide which curve we're going to go for. So let's say we have a H over B is greater than uh, 1.2 for this shape. Uh, and we're going to go about the um, ZZ axis. Then we're going to use curve B. We take curve B here. Once we know what the normalized slenderness value is, so we work that out from the cross-sectional properties. So if the normalized slenderness value is 1, we come up to 1 until we hit curve B. We come across here, and that tells us the reduction factor is 0 0.65 or so. Uh, 0 0.65, that means that we can in uh, buckling, lateral uh, buckling, uh, or global buckling, the, the element can only take about 65% of what it could take across the cross section. Okay, so if we can stop that from local buckling, we could increase the capacity by another 35%. In other words, go from the 65% factor here up to 100%. So the imperfection uh, uh, values that we're going to get, so if we're going to get, uh, say, take curve B here, go down to table 6.1, that's curve B, that imperfection factor is 0.34. We plug that into the formula down here. We plug in the normalized sinus value, we get uh, this um, phi value back out, plug phi in, plug the normalized sinus value in, and we get the reduction factor. So effectively, that, those equations, the table and the equations, is what has been used to plot uh, figure 6.4. So we can either use 6.4 to get the values out of it, or we can plug them directly into the, into the formulas here. Yes, I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, that's a rolled eye section, for example, uh, if I had a box section. If it's hot finished, I would use curve A in this case. No matter what uh, axis I'm buckling about, if it's a cold form, I would use curve C. Okay, so summary on this. Uh, what, what do we need to do to be able to design this? So we need to work out what the column cylindrus is, which is going to be the critical uh, buckling length divided by the radius gyration. That'll give us the um, column cylindrus, the cylindrus of the compression member. The buckling parameter is a reference um, Slimness value, which is 93.9 epsilon. So once we know uh, what the material 
uh, strength is because epsilon. Uh, so we know that uh, epsilon oh, epsilon is equal to the square root of 235 all over Fy. So once we know what the material strength is, which you can get from table 3.1, once we know what that is, we know what the epsilon is. The non-dimensional slimness value then, as I said, it's the square root of the cross-section resistance divided by the el elastic coupling resistance, or uh, the normalized or the slenderness value divided by the reference slenderness value. We have worked out the slenderness value. We've worked out the reference slenderness value. So therefore, we get the normalized slenderness value. We can use that value then to work out what the reduction factor is, and then put multiply is a reduction factor to multiply by the cross section resistance, and that will give us the coupling capacity. So that's what we're going to do in the in the example. Um, so in the example, what we're going to do is going to check the suitability of this section here, uh, which is a 356 by 368. UKC 129, um, which is the steel grade, or sorry, which is the weight of the steel in kilograms per meter, and it's grade S275 uh, in there. It's got simple support on the top and bottom. It's got an applied load of 3,000 kilonewtons in there. Its overall length, L, is 6 meters. So we're going to design that element uh, for, to check to see uh, what its buckling capacity is and to see if we can withstand that load of 3,000 kilonewtons. So we're going to utilize the example to illustrate uh, local buckling, flexural buckling, and not today, but um, next week we will also use it to um, demonstrate torsional buckling. Okay, so I'm going to take a break um, uh, there, and then I'll spend the next uh, half hour or so um, doing the um, doing this example. Okay, so we'll just stop there, and we'll take a break uh, for about six or seven minutes. Okay, until about half past. <laughs> 